Welcome to Sexology, a podcast that untangles the science of sex and pleasure. And now, with this week's episode, your host, clinical psychologist, Dr. Nazanin Moali. Hello there. You are listening to episode 147 of Sexology Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Nazanin Moali. I hope you are enjoying your day uh, here in LA. It's 4 a.m. on Friday. And the reason that I'm up at 4 a.m. on my non-clinical day is that I decided to co-create this book club. It sounded so fantastic. I always wanted to be part of a book club. So with some of my colleagues, we got together a few months ago and decided that we're going to do the book club together and taking turn on choosing a book. My colleague got to choose the first book. This is a novel about theory of relativity, a kind of a heavy novel. Whenever I opened the book, I was like, oh God, I cannot do this today. Not today. The content is great, but that's not kind of novel I read. And I never thought that would happen. Next time, like note to yourself, join the club that people are interested in the same kind of books that you got, you are interested in. Anyhow, the book club is in few hours. I'm feeling like a bad student. And I was like, okay, I set an alarm at 4 a.m. and I'll read the book. So that's why I'm up this early. Anyhow, today we're going to talk about some of the misconceptions that people have when it comes to having a lasting relationship. Many people, especially my female client, they had this image of what is the good relationship look like? Uh, what does happy ending look like? Because we never see like after Cinderella gets married, how is it when they are like leaving a domestic life and the partner leaves the socks around and Cinderella doesn't want to do the dishes. <laughs> Anyhow, so they're telling us about what are some of the secret sauce for having a good relationship. They're telling us how we can ask our partner to do things inside the bedroom and outside the bedroom that will help us to have greater connections. Our guests are Chris Mary and Susan Clark. But before I tell you guys about their background and read their bio, I wanted to share with you guys that I got all of your questions. I'm trying to record an answer. Maybe like tomorrow I wake up at 3 a.m. Anyhow, I'm, I'm thinking about releasing a bonus episode. Hopefully it's going to get released next next Thursday, which would be the two days from the time that this one goes live or on Friday. And I'm going to talk about some of the questions that you guys ask and I'll give you some answers. Love getting questions. Keep them coming. You can email them to me at drmoali at sexologypodcast.com or you can better even record your voice on our website. So Chris Mary Campbell, an Olympic rower, Boeing flight test engineer, has her MBA, and Susan Clark, a former marriage therapist and coach, are the authors of Beauty of Conflict, Harnessing Your Team's Competitive Advantage, and their forthcoming book, The Beauty of Conflict for Couples. As partners in work and life for over two decades, they adapted their proven step-by-step -step process on working with Fortune 100 companies to help long-term couples use conflict as a catalyst to greater intimacy, passion, and fulfillment. Here's my conversation with Chris Marie and Susan Clark. Hello and welcome to another episode of Sexology Podcast. I am so excited and honored to have Chris Marie and Susan on our show. Welcome to our show. Thank you. This is Chris Marie. We're excited to be here. Yeah, and this is Susan. Yeah, we're very keen on what's going to happen. This conversation. <laughs> you're, you're our first sexologist. Just oh, so yes. you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And also pressure. I love your book. <laughs> it's wonderful. And I was sharing with you guys and the listeners, even during the introduction, that I loved it 
different approach that you guys are, are focusing when it came to kind of cultivating a good relationship. So I'm very excited for this conversation and I'm sure it will be very informative for our listeners. So you talk about good relationships in your book. And mm-hmm. some of the misconceptions that people have that I see every day as well in my practice. So tell us, what are some of these uh, common misconceptions that people have when it comes to having a, a quote-unquote good relationship? Yes, this is Chris Marie. And one of the most common misconceptions is that a good relationship is one where everything is smooth. And we don't fight, we get along. And that's, that was my going in assumption. And I was working really hard to make everything smooth. And I was exhausted and wondering, why don't I feel better? We're, we're getting along. I don't want to rock the boat. And, and we actually believe that it's important for each person to show up fully. And when you do, you're going to bump into conflict. And that means it's not going to be smooth. But that's a real opportunity for vitality and aliveness and juiciness to show up in the relationship. I, could, I think another, and this may be in the same line, this is Susan, but in the, is this idea that relationships, good relationships are about compromise. And we are really believers that compromise, there might be, there are probably time and a place to compromise, but in general, it's not always a good thing for a relationship. And that there is a difference between showing up fully and coming up with a way to uh, address what seems like strong differences than actually deciding to compromise. Because too often when you compromise, you're actually letting go of something that's really important to you. And if that happens too much over time, the relationship actually gets deadened and goes down versus being willing to not settle for a compromise, but each show up fully and trust that there is a a way in which you can come to a more co-creative choice about what to do next. We actually talk about relationship math, mean, and what we mean by that is one whole person times one whole person equals a whole relationship. But if I'm compromising or not speaking up and showing up halfway, one half times one whole equals a half of a relationship. And then if both of us show up halfway, then we've got a quarter of a relationship. So it's diminishing (laughs) returns. Yeah, I love this. And I agree with you that for the first one that uh, you guys were mentioning about, people have this expectation that everything needs to be smooth if, if we want to have a good, good relationship. And they get so worried if there's a period of conflicts, especially young couples that I see. And I tell mm. people, if as long as it's 60 to 70 percent of the time, it's good enough. <laughs> it's more you're doing better than most of the people and they're gonna of course will be there days that there will be suffering and conflict and argument because you're living with two different people how yes. is it possible that you guys all the time want the same thing have the same opinion so I really like that you were emphasizing the importance of people showing up to individual versus when people saying like oh I'm looking for my better half or <laughs> she's my better half or he's my mm-hmm. better half it's kind of undermining where people's kind of individual ability and the, the contribution that they make it to in their relationship and I like that the, sometimes the issue as you guys were mentioning is compromise too often people kind of giving these gifts of letting go of what they want, but when they're not fully okay with that. And I think that can be a problematic issue in a relationship. Absolutely. If I'm, go ahead, Susan. Yeah. I mean, if I'm always giving up what I, what I want without really being clear that that's what I'm doing and recognizing that it's a choice, I become resentful. And the, and the irony about resentment is it's very, we, it usually gets projected onto the other person. And generally it's about where I have given myself up. And that's a really hard, tricky place for people to get. But like whenever I feel resentment, I, I look at where am I not supporting and respecting my own boundaries and because it's generally about me. It's not about the other person. I mean, this comes up in our relationship. I got involved in community theater acting, you know, just the last 10 years. And when I started to do it, I'd be afraid to tell Susan because we travel for our work. And I, you know, when you're in a play, you have to be home for six weeks. And Mm -hmm. so I'd be like, well, I got a part in a play and she'd, she'd have a reaction and I'd be, "Uh uh-oh, I better not take it. Or, you know, I'd try to make it go away. And she would be like, no, 
you know, you need to actually do what's important to you and let me have my reaction over here. Yeah, because I need to deal with that. That was my responsibility to deal with my discomfort. And and if she decided not to do the play, I knew that she wasn't going to be as alive and and as full in her life. And it didn't mean it didn't have an impact on me, but I definitely didn't want her to just pull away and not do what was important to her. I wanted to be able to have my I'm upset about it, and you're going to go do that play because it's I think a good even, thing for you. <laughs> even tell me where I'm wrong, Susan, but you even felt some resentment, and that drove you to actually figure out what was important for you to be doing yes. while I was in this play for six weeks. Exactly. Yeah. What a beautiful story as far as like uh, you guys shared with us as far as give and take that you guys did it in the relationship. And I think it's very healthy for all couples to have this open and honest conversations when it comes to things that they like that their partner perhaps are not into it. And if we are constantly giving up, then I see it all the time in my practice that people, I don't know, 20 years, 30 years, they say, I don't recognize myself. I don't have any of the hobbies that they have. And they have this strong resentment and frustration toward their partner because they kind of blame the partner because they turn to this person that they don't recognize it anymore. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah, they've been giving up the parts of themselves, thinking they're being a good partner and doing it for the relationship. But that's again, showing up halfway and it it doesn't create aliveness inside of you or inside of the relationship. Yeah. And definitely will destroy a, a healthy sexual relationship. If you're constantly giving yourself up, how can you possibly be fully there to meet your own needs plus your partner's needs? Because, you know, you're resentful. That doesn't, that doesn't lead to great sex, <laughs> at least in my opinion. Maybe angry <laughs> <No>. sex. <laughs> but, okay. Absolutely. And I think when you're doing things that you enjoy, it brings vitality and excitement in you. And that helps with sex. Oh, yeah. Oh, I mean, one funny thing about Chris Marie's acting career is that she almost always gets picked to play the parts of the sexy cop or the sexy, you know, some sexy role Mm -hmm. in the movie. And she has some guy that she's having some sort of relationship with up on the stage. And often, you know, I would be like, okay, make me jealous. Go ahead. See if, you know, because, and at first I I could feel threatened by it. And then I realized, wow, she's so alive up there and she's coming home with me. This is a good thing. And (laughs) just let you know, I would often tell her the guys that were acting with her, yeah, go ahead. Try to make me jealous. Let's see what you can do. And it was more fuel for fun. bedroom. Go ahead. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> you know, so. Was there any other misconception that was present in your mind that you haven't talked about? The one, the other one I was thinking is I, I think a lot of times couples miss have a misconception about what intimacy is and the idea that int- intimacy means that we're always close and connected and it's. And intimacy is simply a knowing of myself and the other, or as we put it, an intimacy. And sometimes that's a beautiful, loving, wonderful experience. And sometimes it's showing the ugly underbelly. I'm not this person, but that's also intimacy. And it's like, I think sometimes people think we have to be close. And sometimes you have to acknowledge the distance that's there. And that can be very hard for people because they think that's not a good relationship are not going to lead to more intimacy and actually will if you're willing to be honest and hang out there and talk to each other and instead of assuming it's a bad thing. To actually be revealing of how distant I am because in that I am revealing me, she gets to know. And even if I talk about what's making me so distant right now, I'm sharing me, I'm learning more about me, and she's witnessing me. So we're connected in that. And it's a location. I have a location for where she really is instead of some false assumption that we're always going to be close. And this communication, I would imagine, and I know you talk about it in the book, and perhaps we can talk about it later, is that it's an art to bring yes. it up in a way that's saying that this is where I am with things and and it's not necessarily reflecting on who the person, like who you are as a person and kind of like bringing it up tactfully. So I think it's important to people for people to cultivate these skills of having good communications around these challenging topics. Yes, we we have a lot of tools in the book to help you have kind of sensitive or tough conversations. And there's also the art of it is recognizing, you know, we did not get trained in this and usually we didn't have good role models. So when I bring up something that I'm wanting and, you know, just like the play, Susan 
is allowed to have her reaction. I think I was trained to automatically smooth it over anytime somebody had a reaction. So be willing to tolerate, cultivate this ability to tolerate somebody else having a reaction and you not being wrong just because they're having a reaction and just holding and witnessing your partner like, wow, that's really impacting you. And that's, that's very different than how we've seen things done, at least how I saw things done growing up. <laughs> Absolutely love that because for kids, for the, when we're babies and like, you know, when, when we're having a reaction and if the parents are not, if the mother is not okay with that, our livelihood is kind of connected to that mm-hmm. because it's a source of nurture and love. And as an adult, I think it's, it's hard for people who kind of to learn to be okay, as you said other people having their own reactions and not internalizing it, uh, internalizing them. Yes. yes. I mean, I think you have to retrain. I had to retrain my nervous system because it would react. I would react automatically. My body would react thinking it's life or death. And we even have some tools in there to de-escalate how you're feeling. So you could make a different choice mm-hmm. because I do think it's hardwired that way. So so strongly. Absolutely. So I wanted to talk about another misconception that you guys probably have heard about is as well. People think if they have a good relationship, automatically, that means that they're having great sex. What do you think about that? <laughs> well, Actually, I think that's a, that is totally what people think. And I think it's the opposite of a lot of times of what happens. I mean, often as the couples get closer and get to know each other and there's more intimacy in a relationship and it, it, that is a qualifier for a good relationship, their sexual, their sexual drive might go down a bit unless they pay attention to it and keep working with it and recognize that sexuality is not linked to or glued to intimacy or having a good relationship. Sexuality, and plus sexuality is something, I have my own sexual experience and my partner has theirs. And too often it's like, well, if, we're, if we have a good sex life, we we should both be feeling like we have a great sex life. And sometimes that's just not how it works unless you really recognize that you have different needs, different desires. It's so often we think, okay, I found my person and now they should satisfy all my sexual needs. And the the partner thinks the same way, like you shouldn't be attracted to anybody else. And it's like, we are living, breathing human beings. And thank goodness we hopefully spot that person over there and go, Ooh, that looks good. And, you know, we're responding to our environment that can actually do a lot to recharge the sexual relationship in my partnership. If I'm not necessarily going out to be with that person, but I actually turn and say, did you see that guy? And, Ooh, this is what I like about him. That's a way to recharge in a, like I'm sharing my attraction, but I'm not acting on it. And that's a way for my partner, Susan, to get to know, ooh, this is what turns her on and this is what's juicy. Cause, so it's a, she's learning more about me, but I'm putting the sexual charge back in the relationship. I so agree with this because sometimes people have this expectation that, first of all, good good relationship is translating to good sex, which that's not true at all. There are cases that people have good relationship and good sex, but that's not necessarily in like a cause and effect situation. Mm -hmm. Another piece of it is in long term relationship, as you're sharing with us, people need to recharge this sexual energy. Unless you are focusing on it, working on it, recharging it, being playful about it, that that passion dies or gets exactly. like significantly less. So it's important to have strategies to make sure that you are feeling excited and your partner is also getting excited. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I think so often I put the responsibility or people, this is another misconception, like my partner is responsible for my sexual happiness <laughs> and I can learn so much about my own body because usually we weren't taught about our own anatomy and how to self pleasure. And cause that, you know, just wasn't, you know, that's kind of shameful in a lot of, in a lot of cultures and society. And I can do so much, even the clothes that I wear, the underwear, the scents that I put on to, to turn myself on and make me feel alive and also then to educate my partner about what works and what doesn't for me or what I want to try or things like that. Well, and it is tricky. I mean, sometimes, you know, I I know I can, if I am in a place where I'm not feeling good about myself and she's telling me, you know, I'm attracted over here, I'm doing, and I feel incredibly threatened by that. Now, 
what I can, what I have done sometimes is gotten angry about it. And that when, as soon as I do that, what I know is going on is I'm not really satisfied with myself and I need to come back and reground in me and say, wait a second, you know, this isn't about me. This is about her. But when I start to slide into making it all about me, I know it's because I don't have enough sense of myself and I need to actually reground and, and go back there and decide what can I do to take care of myself as opposed to making it about her. But that's a tricky spot sometimes to recognize, you know, because I could get really quickly fall into, oh, there must be something wrong with me. It's like, Okay, that's interesting. You went there, you know. <laughs> yeah, so. absolutely, and I, and I agree with with you guys that I think being able to know your body, showing up as a, a sexual person in the bedroom is your responsibility. Yeah. Because I know sometimes people, these my, my uh, heterosexual clients that are coming in, uh, some women saying that you know he's not helping me climax, or I'm not enjoying sex. It's all his responsibility. <laughs> but if you if you, if you don't know your body then that's that's problematic too because I think if you are you are aware of your body what you like and what don't you like you're coming into the to this kind of sexual relationship as a person that knows what works for them versus like having having this an expectation that kind of oftentimes creates pressure in the relationship so I love what you guys said about that I know that one of the interesting things that you listed in the book was some unconventional ways that people can feel close Closer to their partner. Can you share that with us? Well, one of the ways that we can feel closer is when we actually reveal something that we haven't been wanting to talk about. Because when I have a topic that I'm afraid to bring up, I'm uh, energetically, I'm creating distance from Susan. And as soon as I'm willing to risk saying something that could upset her, there's a sense that I feel more whole. And yes, she has her own processing to do with it. But there is a sense that I'm not then holding back and creating more distance with her. So I feel, I can feel closer to her in that because I'm showing up more as me. So that's a big, I mean, right there, that's a big one. I mean, the other th thing that I think we talk about is that, you know, this, well, I'll talk about it from the standpoint of kind of classic relationship or marriage and family therapy talks about, you know, date days, date nights, mm -hmm. things like that, which is, I don't think that's all good stuff. But what I think is really critical around this idea of doing something like a date or date, date, date night is to risk doing it like to what the way I challenge couples to do it is, okay, you each get to pick, you're going to flip a coin who picks first and you take one day or one evening and you pick anything that is you are passionate about that you want to experience and your that's your job and your partner's job is to say yes and to be curious and engage in it if they even if they're not interested to engage in it from the thing of this is something my partner's passionate about i want to be curious and interested in it and i've done this for years with couples and there was there's just one one couple that i worked with that's kind of the classic story for me because they were at a very dire point in their relationship. And I suggested this and they went away for two weeks. And when they came back, they were like totally different. And, and they said, we did it. We did it. And I said, well, okay, tell me about it. And she goes, we went, he, it was his turn and he chose nude bungee jumping. And I had this <laughs> moment where I was like, you gotta be kidding. That wasn't really, I can't imagine that stretching this, but, but I, I held, you know how you are as a therapist, you're supposed mm -hmm. to wait, don't get, you know, and um, she, she said, you know, initially I was really like, you've got to be kidding. This is taking advantage of this. I can't say, say yes. But then I heard your voice in my head saying, be curious, be interested, ask him some questions. And it ended up, you know, he was, he was only doing it because you could do it for free. So it was like, and he said, I'm this, I feel very vulnerable even asking you to do this, but I think it would be fun to try. They had this great dialogue and then they went and did it and they were both so free, but both parts were critical to them to have the conversation, to risk doing something different. And she had made so many assumptions about what he was up to. And he said, look, I am, I don't want to go nude, but I want to go for free. So that's the reason we're doing this. And so it was, they had this shared experience, but ever since then, I really did get, oh, this idea that experiment, try things and be willing if you don't want to do it, go in with a different approach. Like, I'm just curious why my partner wants to do this. And it can change everything and it could be very exciting. You know? 
And I think that changing that dance can also be very powerful. I, I use something similar, but around sex and sexuality, because I'm a sex therapist. <laughs> and we talk about like, yes, yes and no, maybe list. We go over it with our, um, with my clients and the couples. And we talk about what are some of the things that are absolutely off limits. So I don't want people saying yes to something when they don't want to do it at all. Mm-hmm. It's like against their integrity values, any, any of those good things. And then mm-hmm. afterward, then they take turn doing things like sexually mm-hmm. and the partner needs to say yes, because if they didn't want it, if they, they didn't want it, they should have said no. <laughs> and <then> obviously <laughs> you can, like it's something, it's non-consensual and stuff. You can always say no, of course. But sometimes in, in marriages and relationship, people get stuck in this place of having leftover sex. What happens <laughs> is the partner say, I don't want it that. The other partner say, oh, thank God we're not doing that. They're doing the same thing for 34 years oh, mm-hmm. and it can get very boring and people check out. So we're changing things and asking the partner that we're doing this because of what I want it. And that's the, within that kind of defined, defined structure that we talked about it in the session, that can be very transformative. So I think even in the bedroom, that idea of being like as a whole person, not necessarily being part of like half of a person, I think is really important. So I know that you have, you guys have lots of good information when it comes to communication, specifically around sexual communication. One of the challenges that I have seen in my practice a lot is people sometimes they know what they want and what their partner are doing is not working for them like the way that they kiss them or it's oral sex they don't like or they don't like the way they get touched but they just devastated and scared because they don't know what how to bring it up so their partner wouldn't get offended and on top of that how to say what they really want so tell us about some of the good strategies that you have around this addressing this issue Mm-hmm. Well, one of the things, and, and even thinking about men versus women, because women, and so even it's, it's supplying some information because women have 8,000 nerve endings in their clitoris, and it's a, it's a solely functioning tool for joy, and men have a multi-purpose tool and only have 4,000 nerve endings. So the <laughs> sensitivity in those two genital areas is very different. And sometimes women don't know that. And sometimes men don't know that. So there's some, there's some, even some basic information that would be helpful in that conversation that may not be as threatening to hear. It's just kind of like, this is just how we're wired differently. But then also when I'm, you know, like, oh, something's happening and I'm not, you know, comfortable with it, or I don't like it is to actually stop and probably talk about it when it's not happening. So take the heat off, not in the moment. I wouldn't start in the moment. I would talk about, hey, this is what I really like that's working, and this is what I'm uncomfortable with, and I'm talking about myself and not making it about my partner doing something wrong, just this is not my preference, this is not more sensitive, this is, and I would demonstrate what I do like, so talking more about me would be my two cents. And I I think the other piece of this that's, that's kind of tricky is, you know, I I have to be willing to say something and, you know, with the caveat that I don't want my partner to be offended, but I don't, I can't really control them. So I need to give them the room to say, you know, Hey, I want to talk about this. It may be something that you are upset about. And I, but I still think we need to talk about it. So give them a little space to know that, that that I'm concerned about how it's going to be, but it, it's more about me than it is about them. But I have to realize that they still might, you know, it, they still might be offended. But can I allow for that and stay curious and interested? Like, I see you're having a big reaction to what I said. And what I really wanted was to let you know something about my desires and what works for me. And I think you're taking it on. And let me know, you know, what is going on for you. So that idea that they might be offended. But the risk if they of just continuing to not show up, that could even be more deadening. So. You can even use it. We have a simple tool in the book called the 555, which is it's a 
It's a boundary conversation tool where each person takes five minutes. The first person talks for five minutes, so it could be about sex. And the second person talks for five minutes about sex. And then the last five minutes is a dialogue. So it's 15 minutes. So it's, it's going to end. It's <laughs> <laughs> Good not, news for my male clients. <laughs> exactly. It's not a 5-5-45. Five, five, right. And so you can do that over, you know, outside of the bedroom as a way of just kind of bringing more information forward about what's interesting to you, what's working working, what's not. And it gets to deeper issues rather than, you know, this is why it's so important to me that this happened. So it kind of expands the conversation just rather than just don't touch me like that, you know, the top line conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think with that is uh, what's important is for people to give themselves space to hear someone else's perspective. What, what's interesting that I noticed about myself, that there were some deep held beliefs, not necessarily around bedroom, but around different things in my life. And as a therapist, we're showing up in the room, be trying to nudge non-judgmental and being present for our clients. And because I was not that stand and I heard people's perspective openly, now some of my views changed because mm-hmm. I could see really hearing that what where people were coming from in these issues. And I think the relationship also, it's the challenge is to kind of really pausing and listening to what the partner's saying instead of preparing what you're going to say next. Because I can imagine that like, people are thinking about next five minutes, I'm going to say this, 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 and they're not necessarily thinking about uh, what the person is saying. Do you have any recommendation around to, how to kind of correct that? Well, I mean, one, you know, that is so classic of an example. I mean, in a couple in particular, if if my partner, if, if she's talking about sex and I'm the person having sex with her, I could easily take it on as this has got to be about me. So, of course, everything in my body is going to be wired to defend, explain, you know, if I know that going in and can do some things to settle myself, that's probably most important. And if I am in reaction, to be able to say, right now, I am having, I realize I've gotten really ungrounded because you're saying stuff and I'm like uncomfortable. So to just even be vulnerable and willing to acknowledge the impact it is having in the moment, because that's going to help me settle back down again and show up differently. And another thing that we always suggest to couples that's really important is, you know, when you're really stuck, be ask, you know, ask that question. Why is this so important to you right now? What's going on? To be curious. And uh, I think Chris Marie wants to say something. So. Well, just even listening with the willingness to be influenced, but know that I don't, I don't have to agree. So we often talk about reflecting back what you're hearing, the gist and the emotional tone, like I get, this is so important to you because you think it means I don't love you. And not make that, again, it's tolerating that this is a different person. It doesn't mean I automatically have to do something different or be something different. I can just witness my partner as this is how she puts the world together or he puts the world together. And and really having empathy for that human that's sitting over there as opposed to, oh gosh, this means I'm the problem. Absolutely. And I, and I love the point that you mentioned that being okay, knowing that the partner will have a reaction mm-hmm. because they, if we're seeing them as a true, like a, as another person, we kind of allow them to have their own experiences and not mm-hmm. necessarily get flustered or kind of like back paddle because, because they had a reaction to it. And also you're right that it's important to kind of ask the question of where are you coming, coming on on this one? Why is this an important thing for you? And then there could be a possibility for negotiation and maybe perhaps doing something that both partner works. Do do you have any other tips and tricks around bed and sexuality that you want to share with our clients? Yeah, I was thinking about one of the things that, especially this is for women, women have a really hard time with their own anger because we're not, we're supposed to be nice and polite. Nicer girls don't get angry. And anger is really, I think, juicy energy. And when I get more in touch with my anger, I can get more in touch with my empowerment, my my second chakra, which is my sexuality. And so we have a tool in there called the Vesuvius. Like, and it's it's a great partnership tool to practice expressing your anger in a really boundaried way where your partner has the timer, you get two minutes and you just, you can do a tantrum, you can do a punching the pillows, you can, whatever you folks, you decide together what's in and out of bounds. It's just kind of like you won't hurt yourself, your property or anybody else. But to really access that 
energy, which is actually a huge life force. And most people have anger velcroed to violence. And so doing it, expressing anger in this really boundaried way, I think helps wake women up, especially to their, hmm. Well, also, I think for men and women, you know, it gives you the chance to witness that anger is not the same as violence. And Mm -hmm. they are so often Velcroed together. And so if you can tease it apart and recognize I'm seeing a full expression of my partner here and I'm okay, I'm over here, we have clear, we've set up boundaries, there's a path, and then have my opportunity to fully express. And then, I mean, that, that can be a way to get to some really great, contact with each other, which can lead to great sex. And, you know, after I express my, my cheeks are flushed, my eyes are dilated. It's very much similar to sexuality in that way. (laughs) Love that. And what a creative way of kind of spicing things up in the sense that like awakening your emotions. And I agree Mm -hmm. that many women have issues, excluding myself with anger, because that's not a message that we were uh, learned from the society that that's, that's okay, or it's attractive. So it's, I'm glad that you're having this uh, tools to help people getting connected with that part of themselves. Mm-hmm. The, yeah. the one other thing that I'd mentioned that I, and we talk a bit about this in the book, mm-hmm. uh, is this concept of boundarying or boundaries, because so often people, people think boundaries are telling somebody else what they can and can't do. And boundaries are really about my willingness to self-define and say what I want and don't want. And the willingness for me to also, it's not about the other person having to agree to it or disagree to it. I'm the one who needs to support my boundaries. And I think this comes up really, is really important in a relationship to realize that I need to be recognized, what am I going to do to support my boundary? And it's not about defense. It's about potentially dialogue. It's about letting the other person know what I like and dislike. And that, that, that I'm the one who's going to take that responsibility to support my boundary and not get angry when, oh, well, wait a minute. I said you couldn't do that and you did it. That, you know, it's like, okay, that's interesting that you made that choice. Now, what am I going to do to support my own boundary? It's a very different take. And I think it's important that people realize that. And and it's huge around sexuality for me to actually take mm -hmm. care of, you know, even being willing to say, this is my fantasy or this is what I like, you know, all that is really juicy, creates a lot of energy in the relationship. Mm Excellent. I love this wonderful new recommendation that you guys are having. And I, I can totally hear the creativity in them, which is, <laughs> which is really good because I feel like our recommendation and the suggestion and tips and sex therapy is kind of, I hear over and over the same thing. Anyhow, I love this conversation. Aww. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank us. Tell us if our listeners want to get a hold of you, what would be the best way? Yes, we have, well, we have a podcast called The Beauty of Conflict. That's another way to listen to us. And we are at, our website is Thrive Inc, T-H-R-I-V-E-I-N-C.com. And our book, Conflict for Couples, is on Amazon, IndieBound, Barnes & Noble. And we also have a website just for that called beautyofconflict.com. So those are a few ways. And you can find us on Instagram at Thrive Inc and Facebook. Susan Clark and Chris Marie Campbell. We'd love to connect to your you. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I thank you guys. I believe a link to the URL in the show notes in case if people were not able to uh, write it down. Thank you so much. And this was very informative and helpful. And I'm sure our listeners enjoyed as well. Have a great day. Thanks. Thank Thanks you. so much, yes. Naz. I hope this conversation helped you to understand what can you do to address the conflict in your relationship and also what to do and how to ask for what you want in the bedroom and outside the bedroom. Honestly, in my opinion, 60% of getting what you want in bed and having wonderful sexual experiences comes from you clearly asking what you want in a clear way. So there's a magic to it, right? Because sometimes we're demanding things. Sometimes we are nagging. So we are doing all this thing that doesn't work. But if you master the art of asking things what you want without making your partner defensive, I can guarantee that like most of your problem can get resolved. Anyhow, at the end, I wanted to thank all of you guys who wrote us Honest Review on iTunes I really am grateful for every single review I get. It's not for my ego. Of course, it's lovely to hear all the great things that you are 
writing about this show. But more importantly, when you subscribe, when you write the review, it helps us to climb higher in iTunes charts. And what it does is help us to get more visibility and help us to be able to reach a broader audience. Because as you know, this is a passion project. This is something I'm doing purely out of my love for sex education. And you are my marketing department. Super easy to write a review. <laughs> Funny thing is, as I wanted to write, uh, read the review, I pull it up and I accidentally gave myself a one star. It's that easy that you can just like press on the stars. So I wanted to give a shout out for people that wrote us reviews in past couple of weeks. Cortin, five star review, uh, wrote very good podcast. Philip EBT, say yes to pleasure, wrote, give us another five-star review. He or she said, this was one of my favorite episodes and this podcast is awesome, very informative. Thank you so much for listening. And I think she or he or they referred to the Say Yes episode that I recorded with Alicia. And the last one is Sweet Girls, Girl She. And she wrote new favorites. But a wonderful podcast. It's intelligent, scientific, and open-minded, but at the same time remains empathic and honest. The guests are great and the solo shows are equally as enjoyable. Thank you so much. I'm very grateful that you are listening. I hope you guys take a second and write us a review. And I guess I'll talk to you guys next Thursday when I'm releasing the bonus episode. I love you and can't wait to connect again. Thanks for listening to Sexology Podcast. For more great content, visit www.sexologypodcast.com. Please be advised that information presented on this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health provider.